Hi, welcome to the Eternal Spirit Show. I'm Paul Salmon, I'm a psychic medium. My guest today is Deb Hawkin, fellow psychic medium. Hi Deb. <laughs> Hi Paul. But not only psychic medium, also life coach, and inspirational speaker or talker. Yeah, yeah. Speaker, speaker <laughs> always a talker. Better, always yeah. talker. And soon to be published author, I believe. Um, I hope so. I'm working on it. Fingers I'm, crossed. Um, I've been working on a book for 20 years, and maybe one day I'll actually get it finished. But it's it's taking a better shape. I'm beginning to get more of a feeling of what the book ought to be about. Um, I think, like a lot of people, I've tried to aim my book at the psychic and spiritual field, and actually that isn't where it belongs. I'm trying to attract people maybe who wouldn't even think about the psychic and spiritual field mm. and show them how useful believing that you are mind, body and spirit mm. can be. So I've got a really funny cover for it now. Have you? Yeah, I've started designing that. So I'll tell you what, come back when it's all published. Yeah. Oh. And you've got a book, we'll bring it back, we'll do a... Yeah, that's a challenge now. Book. That's <laughs> yeah. a challenge. I'll set you a challenge. Yeah. Well, I've got the cover, so we've got a book. <laughs> Deb, how did you get into mediumship in the first place? Completely by accident. Um... I had absolutely no idea that I was a medium. I can't tell you I've been seeing spirit all my life or even known they were there. I haven't. There was one incident that couldn't be explained when I was six years old, just after my grandfather died, but mm. that was it. Um, and I was a very, very normal person, but I made an extremely bad marriage for both of us. I'm not knocking him. It was no better for him than it was for me. And um, I gradually started to spiral downhill because I was in the wrong job. My parents didn't like the person that I had to be married to him, and I don't blame them. My in-laws weren't keen on my parents' daughter because we came back from a very different background. Um, my colleagues didn't really like any of those people, and I was as completely lost as it was possible to be. And I had a friend called Keith McFarlane, who, bless his heart, was my mentor till the day he died, and probably still is. And he came to see me one night to do some hypnotherapy to try and help me get my head sorted out you know, because I didn't want drugs. I knew somehow I could sort my head out. And the first thing he said to me is, do you have to understand, Deb, you're not just a human being. You're not the person you think you are. Your name always hasn't always been Debbie. You are mind, body, and spirit. You're 10,000 years old. You've got 10,000 years of wisdom behind you. You've got 100 lifetimes. Mm. And I must admit, I looked at him and thought, yeah. yeah. But he said, think about this for a moment, because, you know, when you're in a black hole, you don't feel wise or wisdomous, you know, you just feel like the biggest idiot on the planet. And he said, no, think about it for a minute. What if you weren't just your parents' daughter? Can you let go of a lot of their programming now and a lot of their beliefs and a lot of their attitude towards you? And I thought, yes, I can. And the more I worked with this over the next particularly intensive two years, but another 15 years before he died, I realised how powerful the thought was that any time you don't like an aspect of your personality or you, you don't like being a warrior or you don't like being chasing jobs all the time, you can actually look at that and think, no, I don't need to be this person anymore. I'm spirit. I'm infinitely flexible. The air around me is full of wisdom that I can tune into any time I want it. I can just change. And I've found it very easy to bring about change you know it's not always easy to be a different person mm. but you wouldn't recognize me now from the person I so, was so you had a life transforming absolutely event in your life then absolutely Lasted and it's years. still transforming now yeah a year ago I got on an airplane yeah. and I, no two years ago now I'm sorry two years ago I used to be terrified of flying absolutely hanging onto a pillar at Gatwick airport sobbing my heart out going I can't get on this plane we're all gonna die mm. And then I had one session with a friend of mine who's a hypnotherapist but also channels an extremely powerful guide. Didn't think anything had changed at all, booked up a flight and went to Sweden to teach. Mm. Loved the flight, got off the plane and started to sort of curve around the airport thinking, where's that one going? Mm. And Tony's going, no, you're not, you have to go home now. No, no, I want to go on another plane. And I went to Sweden again three months later, then I flew to Ireland on my own, which was hilarious. And then I went to Sedona in Arizona at the end mm. of that year. And I love flying, I can't wait to get on a plane. But I put that down to spiritual thinking, mm. to that knowledge that I had the choice whether I kept that fear or I changed that mm. fear. And because I'm spirit, because I'm not stuck in a human body, stuck in one way of thinking, when the time was right for me, because I've worked on a lot of fear, mm. this is kind of what I hope to touch wood. Um, 
that was kind of one of the ending bits was to get on an aeroplane that was like the next thing to be dealt with but I put that down to the fact that I feel flexible because mm. I don't feel like I've only ever been Deborah Hawkin mm. I've only ever been this woman in this body that is the only thing I know my life experience is limited mm. to 55 years I don't feel like that I feel so flexible and so able to just change so has that brought you a connection with God? I've always is believed. Is that part of the grand, the bigger picture? I don't believe in God anymore as a man with a long white beard. No. I, I, even when I was a child, I used to quiz my vicar on exactly what he looked like and exactly when would I see him. Mm. Because if I died and there was a man on the throne with a long white beard, I wanted to know when my appointment would be to actually meet this man and yeah. ask him loads and loads of questions. Always wanted to ask God what happened to the Marie Celeste. That was one of my things. I really wanted to know that. Um, but as I've grown older and I've, I've looked around the subject of religion more, God feels to me more like a life force energy and a life force and happiness. And there is an energy that comes from the spirit world when you can tune into it mm. that is breathtaking. You must have experienced it as oh, a medium. A couple of times, when that yeah. love comes through you. It just stops you dead in your tracks, doesn't it? You can't believe when they put a bolt of love through you to a person in the audience mm. suffering. There are no words for that unconditional love, are there? So, going back to the mediumship, when did that kick in? in during a phone call when I was 34. Phone call? I had no idea, literally no idea I was a medium. And I'm on the phone to my friend Leslie. And I did know Leslie well, and I knew that both her parents were in the spirit world. Mm. But as she was talking to me, she said, Deb, why do you keep hesitating? And I said, well, and we, you know, people who don't even know about mediumship will say, I can see that in my mind's eye. Yeah. Well, how did you imagine that? Oh, well, I saw it in my mind's eye when you were talking. Oh, yeah, that is the car I'm buying. Yeah, I saw it in my mind's eye. Mm. And in my mind's eye, I've got two crystal pots. One's got marmalade in it and one's got jam. And all that was going through my mind, like a broken tape loop, was never the twain will meet, never the twain will meet, never the twain will meet. And I couldn't concentrate on what Leslie was saying. So she said, well, tell me what's in your mind that you, is stopping you concentrating. So I told her, she said, I completely understand that, ask for something else. And I said, what do you mean, ask, ask for something else? I'm here on my own, who do I ask? Mm. She said, in your mind, say, could you show me something else, please? So I did. And then a pink rose was laid down. I didn't see a hand, I just saw a rose come in and lay down in front of these two pots. So I told her, and there was other stuff, but I'm afraid my mind went completely blank at, at that point. And Leslie said to me, there's no doubt that's my parents. She said, because their aim when they retired, their life's ambition was to have their condiments in crystal pots. Mm. Dad only liked marmalade, mum only liked jam, and they always said, never the twain will meet. She said, now I'm as sure as I can be that you've only ever heard my mum referred to as my mum or Leslie's mum. Mm. But her name was Rose, and mm. they had pink roses growing all around their front door. And would you say that's the first, like, as far as you're concerned, the first psychic or spiritualist message you Definitely. received? Definitely. It, it, it blew my mind completely. And the rest of the information was for my friend Leslie's friend, Rosemary. Right. And I knew Rosemary existed. I'd heard about her, but mm. I'd never met her. And she said, you've got to come and see Rosemary, because the rest of that was for her. So did you go for interrupting you? Did you go from there to the spiritualist church? And no. Stop, no. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know there were spiritualist churches. I'm sorry, I know that sounds stupid. Mm. I did not know. I'd seen Doris Stokes' work once and it had completely blown my mind. I'd read yeah. her books, which took away my fear of death. And I, I think we have that in well, common. Well, I think we've we, got that in common, haven't yeah, we? About we're, the same age as well. Exactly, yeah, but we owe Doris Stokes the taking away of that fear. Yeah. And I saw her work and she was incredible. Mm. But then I never followed mediumship again. Keith took me to see a local medium once and he was incredible. Someone I can't even remember his name, but he was awesome. Mm. But that was it. I, I just didn't bother because I didn't think in those terms. Mm. So I find myself down with Rosemary describing her ex-husband to her and telling what was rather a sad story but it will show you how unusual it was how her husband insisted that he wanted puppies from their dog mm -hmm. and Rosemary said no she's too old so he takes the dog to somebody who's got a, a boy obviously and came back in tears because he'd had to hold the dog down because she didn't want this now mm -hmm. I'm sorry I know that's going to probably turn the stomach of people listening as much as it still turns mine I think that's a I'm sorry, a horrible thing to do to an animal. 
but that's not something you're going to come out with out of the blue as something easy mm. but I got that and and that blew my mind completely because it, it, I could understand understanding that he took the dog to have puppies against Rosemary's wishes even yeah. but not that mm. n- not that horrible part but of course he would have told me that because it is so unusual and and that was how I got introduced to my guide and my first guide Edward then had to teach me how to be a medium because I didn't know where to go or who to talk to I didn't know what you did with it so are you a, a work, how do you describe yourself a working medium now are yes you? I'm not doing a lot of mediumship at the moment I've been concentrating a lot on writing but yes I am a working medium because I believe you want to help others now the way you've been helped in the past. I, I, that's always lives. been Has my it? main path. Mediumship for me is the cherry on the icing on the cake. Yeah. And it's also a way that I can get contact with people. But what I find a little bit sad, and this is just a p- personal opinion, the spiritual field, people go to churches week after week. That's lovely to have that. But when I go and I do my inspirational speaking, what a lot of the churches mention is how I'm applying what they're doing with mediumship to real life. Mm. How I'm, I'm asking the audience to see that even if they didn't get a message, did they hear the inspiration coming through because it's useful? Did they hear the evidence? Did they think when that lady went, oh my God, no one else knew that, no one else could have. Mm. Did that not make them think, hello, I might be a skeptic, there's more going on here, there's more to life than this. To me, there's a huge importance around mediumship that's applicable right into this life, into how I change. Mm. I'd like everybody to know their, their life guide so that they got advice when they needed but it. But how do you work as an inspirational speaker? How does it work? Um, you stand up, you open your mouth. <laughs> and talk. <laughs> yeah, and an hour or two hours later, someone tells you you were fabulous, and then you get out your notebook and you say, can you tell me what I said, please? So you don't have an agenda in mind, you don't get up and think, I'm going to speak on this subject or... That. I can, sometimes I've got a starting point, I will have said I'm going to do the mystery of mediumship, yeah. which I take mediumship into world peace. Mm. I can actually, through that talk, point out why we're very useful going towards world peace. Um, but then I'll switch out, and a friend of mine seen the mystery of mediumship eight times, mm. and I say to her, you're not coming again, and she said, yeah, because it won't be the same. Is that a title of your... That's one of them, The Mystery, the mystery of, mediumship. of Mediumship. The yeah. other one is the title of the book, Who Am I, Where Am I, What Is This Place? Yeah. You know, um, I've got £86,400 is another one of my talks. Mm. Um, your Right to Happiness. Because that's what it's all about, ultimately, is helping people to be happy and helping them to believe there are an infinite number of ways and an infinite number of tools. And if something doesn't work, drop it, find something else. So you go out speaking in public, or at churches or centres, do people come to see you on the one-to-one basis? Yes, yeah. yes I do. And what sort of people come to see you? All kinds. <laughs> um, I, I get quite a lot of men, yeah. because apparently, according to my birth chart, I'm a masculine energy, and I think I kind of I blend well with men because I don't, I'm not fluffy. Mm. You know, but I get all kinds of people, but I do find that a lot of clients have hit the this is what, who am I, where am I, what is this place is about, is when you get to that point where you think this cannot be it. Mm. You know, surely I wasn't born to go to school, go to college, get a job, have a few romances, get more jobs, get married, have some holidays, have Mm. some houses, retire and then die. You know, that can't be... There's got to be something. There's got to be more than, than this wretched job and chasing money or coming home at the weekends and decorating the house. A lot of people hit a point they want a life. So you're a life coach, if you like? Yes, I'm, I'm, I, I'm very much a spiritual life coach. Spiritual life coach. I yeah. had to give up doing my first sessions free because I, I, the psychic side, as you will know, helps you to understand people very quickly mm. and to feel what they're feeling. And I found that's speeded up the coaching yeah. a lot from what I've heard that other people do. I obviously don't know. I've done, not seen a coach myself, but I've only got the word of what mm. the people who like me say to me. Mm. But of course they like me. But I do feel that the actual psychic side and talking to other psychic life coaches, they all feel the work is faster. Mm. And of course that's the thing. You know, I'd, I wouldn't consider myself to be a successful coach if you came and said to me, oh, said to someone,